Welcome back to WHIP, Philadelphia's number one college radio station. On the line with us today, we've got an awesome guest. He's a longtime Philadelphian. He's an honoree. He's out of Atlantic City. He, his name is Tom Lemayne. He was on WTEL, and for those of you who don't know, that's 610 WIP. And this is before WIP was the, is the sports station that we've all come to know and love. He is also formerly Sixers play-by-play and a meteorologist. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm fine, Zach. Thanks. Yeah, great to have you. Really appreciate it again. Tom, I see you at the Flyers a lot. Where to begin with this team? Shane Gostisbehere has has joined the squad, and seemingly there's a new spark. Well, that spark can uh, that spark can be extinguished real quickly uh, because of uh, financial and salary cap limitations that the uh, team has had right now. So uh, I don't like to see that happen. But uh, not only in the case of uh, Gostisbehere, but uh, in the case of a lot of young players that the Flyers have waiting in the wings. Yeah, they obviously they kept him down at the start of the season because of uh, said contract, uh, things that you discussed earlier. Um, but his talent level has just been something. It's a breath of fresh air for not just a team, but a city that really needs a talent like himself to really, uh, you know, like I said, be a spark for this city. People are throwing the name Eric Carlson around. Goss Despair's game is more of one of those uh, offensive defensemen. He doesn't really hit a whole lot, but he plays great defense with the stick. Um, how do you see him gelling with Giroux and Voracek as the years go on? Well, I, I um, think the best, the best way I describe Shane is that uh, when he's on the ice, you don't know what position he's playing. Uh, that's how versatile and that's how all over the ice he is. Uh, being that kind of a player, you can fit in with anybody. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter who that other player is on the line. You can see right now how quickly he has gelled with uh, the team captain. Uh, uh-huh. And he, he, he um, he's a playmaker. He's a shooter. He probably has probably one of the best shots on the team, which the way that the Flyers are shooting this year doesn't say a whole lot because <laughs> I don't like to have how many times you hear the word wide or high or, or missing the net. Um, they take a lot of shots now, which it hasn't been, hadn't been the case earlier in the season. But uh, how many of them are on target? And when they are on target, it seems like they run into a hot goalie. But getting back to Gus Bear, he, he, uh, he can fit in anywhere, Zach. He, uh, he's just a pure 100% uh, all-around versatile hockey player. And uh, he, you know, like I said, I watch him play. The first time I saw him play in person was in the uh, Frozen Four in the college uh, hockey championships. And I came away from watching him saying that. I Watching him on the ice, I don't know what position he plays. Uh, he's an offensive defenseman, but he's a defensive offensive player too. So uh, that's the best way you can describe him, and that really makes him a good player. He's very, very versatile, and, and that goes so far, not just in hockey, but really in all walks of life. You mentioned his uh, uh, play in the Frozen Four. The guy had a hat trick. He was just out of this world good, and, and what do you know? Now he's playing in the same building uh, for the professional club. Uh, Tom, did you happen to catch the game the other night where they lost in overtime at home? Yes. Yeah, so you saw the shootout, and I want to bring this back to Ghost. You saw in the shootout they threw out there Evgeny Medvedev, second, excuse me, third, and they also put Shane, uh, um, Wayne Simmons second. Do you, do you think they should have uh, put Gostisbehere in there at two or three? Well, one thing I've learned, Zach, after all the years of doing sports, uh, I don't, I don't ever like to take credit for being a Monday morning quarterback. That's the easiest <laughs> position to play in sports. But uh, I know there was a lot of question there. But you know, the coach of the team, he goes with what he feels. I mean, you, you can see the game in person or you can watch the game on television, but you don't have the feel that the coach has when he's standing behind the bench looking at the backs of the players and their numbers and wondering who he's going to send out there, whether it be for the shootout or whether it be for a power play or who he's going to send out there for shorthanded or the next shift for that matter. Um, I don't like to second guess the coach. I, uh, I, I, you know, if he had a feel, that uh, number 82 was the guy he wanted to shoot third, then uh, that's why he's the coach. It's all relative. Yeah. 
you never know who's going to throw out there. Um, it's very easy to play hindsight. It's very easy to be, like you said, a Monday morning quarterback. But instead, let, let's change gears. Let's be the Tuesday afternoon GM. Who do you foresee the Flyers potentially parting ways with as the uh, trade deadline approaches? Well, you know, I, I can tell you who they've tried to part ways with and hasn't happened. I, I, um, I'm i not too sure anything is going to happen, Zach, mm-hmm. because of the efforts that the uh, Flyers management has tried and has, uh, and the efforts that they have made up to this point. Um, I'm sure that if they could have made some kind of a deal between now and the trade deadline, they would have made it already. That doesn't say something's going to happen, but uh, I, um, you know, uh, it, it's it, because of the salary cap restrictions. Um, there's no, and by the way, at this stage of the season, there's no team that's desperate to make any kind of a trade right now. No. You know, if this was like, uh, oh, I need this guy or this guy's going to help help our team make it to the playoffs, we're right on the edge of making the playoffs, that would be different. But um, I would uh, if I would be very surprised if there was a blockbuster trade um, I would think would have happened before now. But, uh, you know, that's why I'm not a general manager. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's very early. I mean, they've only the Flyers only have 20, 28 points. They've only played twenty eight games. Um, they're getting a lot of overtime experience, which I guess is a plus as the season wears on. And and like we talked about at the beginning of this, Shane Gostisbehere's um, appearances has really trended this team in the right direction. They're a promising five three and two um, in their last ten. So you know, it's it's something positive uh, for a team that at the beginning of the season things just really weren't looking too great. But uh, well, I you know before. This recent success that the Flyers have had with the overtime, um, that new overtime rule is probably one of the best things the National Hockey League has ever come up with in its history. Uh, I, agree. I would like to see the I would like to see the uh, three on three um, overtime period uh, extended even longer so that you at one point can possibly eliminate the shootout. Um, I just uh, I, I don't like the shootout. Uh, I don't like I don't like teams ending up in a tie either, for that matter. So let's try to find a happy medium here. Yeah. And I thought the National Hockey League has come up with a that's a great plan. That three on three, you know, if you if you leave a hockey game after regulation or so and don't wait around for the three on three, you're not getting bang for your buck. That is, I mean, it's just like uh, it's like a three on three shootout is what it is. Um, and it, it's exciting. Uh, you know, before I would say, I, oh, I hate to have games end in a tie because we have that dreaded shootout. Well, now uh, I'm not I'm not too sad to see a game end in a tie because I get to see a three on three. And that is really exciting hockey. And uh, as I said, it's probably one of the best rules the National Hockey League has ever come up with. Yeah, as a fan, it's it's pretty it's pretty tough not to be extremely excited going into an overtime session, knowing that you're not only going to get a point, but you're also going to watch a three on three. Yeah, I totally agree. Three on three has been a blessing. It's been incredible uh, for the NHL. It's, it's uh, a faster brand of hockey. Um, it's, it's the way the game is transitioned. Really. Uh, we're talking with uh, me and JT are talking with Tom LeMain. He's from, uh, he's from Atlantic City. He was on WTEL, that's 610 WIP, before they were a sports station. He was also Sixers play-by-play and a meteorologist. He's a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, Tom, you've, you're very experienced in the field of sports media and media in general. How, what, uh, like, over time, what transitions have you noticed uh, in terms of uh, hockey? Well, the uh, injuries, I, I think... Uh... And the way the game is played, I think the big denominator for the way the game is played, I think, in my estimation, is when they went to helmets. If you watch any of the uh, old film video of hockey games when they didn't have helmets, weren't wearing helmets, you notice that uh, most of the game, the play was below the waist. Uh, There were no high sticks. There were no – the the hits were different and the shots – I, I think the introduction of helmets gave players a false sense of security that, uh, okay, now that I have a helmet on, we can do things differently. Um, uh, that was a transition. I saw, if you watch some of the games, everything is, like I said, below below the waist uh, when you don't have a helmet on, when games were played, when the dasher boards didn't have any commercials on them. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, uh, 
obviously, because of the athlete of today, it's a faster, uh, bigger game. Uh, big guys who can skate. I, I've always said, you know, you know, if you ever saw me on ice when I play, you're a big lumbering defenseman. Well, now the big lumbering defenseman is now a big, quick skating defenseman who can go into the corner and get a, you know, a puck out of a scrum and get it out of the zone and skate the puck out of the zone. You don't have to be big and be as small as Shane Gostas Bear, but uh, I think that those are the two differences that I've known, uh, noticed uh, in, in following hockey and the careers that I've been covering sports. Hey, Tom, uh, just want to piggyback off uh, what you just said. Uh, you said you noticed like the, the, the difference between you know hockey back then as it is now. Can you kind of see that same uh, similarity between football uh, when they went from the leather helmets to the helmets with only one you know bar across to now with these new upgraded you know Revolution Speed helmets? How has the game uh, changed uh, from that standpoint? Well, the only change I think, I mean, a head injury is a head injury, um, but I think uh, I've uh, I, you can see that the helmet has been used as a spear uh, more than it was, yeah. uh, you know, back in the day. But you know, I, I'm not a you know I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one, but I, I I don't know how much you can do with a helmet to prevent a concussion. Not only is a concussion occur because of a blow to the head. But it's the sudden shaking of the head back and forth that rattles the brain, and that is what you know in most cases causes a concussion. I don't really know if they're ever going to come up with a super helmet that is going to prevent concussions. As long as you have a contact sport that uh, that football is, uh, there was an injury uh, last week in the NFL where um, the player you know was tackled normally, but he when he fell to the ground, his head hit the ground. Uh, there was no contact to us. There was none of the illegal contact or blow to the head, as they call it now, in the NFL. But um, you know, the, uh, the the astroturf was one of the worst, not only for football but for any sport that was played on just a very thin carpet, basically over a, lab, a slab of concrete. Mm-hmm. Uh, guys who hit their head on on the uh, turf, and many times uh, that causes a concussion, and it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head. I. Um, I don't know as long as you have a contact sport and as long as, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, suspect to, to being hit to the ground and your head is going to make contract, contact with the ground after a, a, a legitimate tackle, I don't know whether you're ever going to prevent those from happening. Yeah, obviously football is a, a contact sport. Hockey is a contact sport, and, and I've talked to people about the same issue, Tom, and a lot of them say, well, if you want to get rid of the concussions, get rid of the helmets. And you sort of understand that side of the argument. I mean, in football, if these guys are flying 100 miles an hour at each other and they're bigger and faster than they've ever been before and they're more equipped and padded and they have the the best helmet technology, they're just going – the collisions are going to be bigger. There's no two ways about it. Um, We're talking with Tom LeMayne. He's from uh, WTEL, former Sixers play-by-play, former Eagles pre- and uh, post-game shows, and a former meteorologist. Tom, we're talking some history with you. Now, Tom, I want to tell you one of my favorite things growing up. Uh, I, I'm a big baseball guy. I'm sure we'll talk baseball sometime. But I, I remember growing up and reading the Philadelphia Inquirer and seeing uh, and always scouring it for the, the home run leaderboards because that's, that's what I like to see. And, you know, obviously follow the week-to-week schedule of my Philadelphia sports teams. Um, I want to get your take on how media itself has changed and how social media has changed. And, and did you ever see something changing like this this quickly? No, uh, you can't keep up with it, Zach. It's, um, I, I, the only problem I have with social media is, uh, and it's a big problem, is that uh, there's no responsibility or accountability for it. Uh, yeah. Somebody can throw out there a, a, a rumor, and that's why it's called a rumor, because it's not fact. And then there's no substantiation to that, and it just swells, and the groundswell of this rumor becomes such that everybody takes it for granted that it's a fact, and it's, it really happened. Quotes that never are quoted from anybody are thrown out there in social media. And, uh, you know, anybody can do that, and uh, there's no there's no accountability for it. And I think that uh, it has just propelled such uh, to such a degree that it's uh, it's way ahead of any kind of uh, any kind of regulation in that regard. Um, it's like um, 
You know, it's like the drones today. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, being being a pilot myself, you know, I, I would be I would really be concerned about landing an aircraft somewhere where you know somebody has their their new drone that they just got for Christmas and they're zipping it over the airport to see what is happening. And you know, and 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 the regulation is way behind on that. Um, you know, anybody can fly one now. There's, of course, there's regulations out there. It can't be more than 400 sure. feet, and you have to be within sight. But just like, um, uh, you know, the drone situation, uh, where the, as you said yourself, uh, the social media has just exploded beyond its, uh, you know, the cart is way, way before the horse. Yeah, we're about to embark on 2016. I'd say around 2007. Kind of with the creation of the smartphone, everything just kind of took off. And yeah, it's hard to imagine where technology is going to be nine years from now, Tom. But uh, we shall see that unfold. Tom, we're running up against it. I just want to thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Well, I want to tell you, that, Zach, I had, I've had a great career. I mean, uh, the year of 80, 81, one of my last years of doing sports before I changed over to uh, weather was the year that all four teams went to the championship game. Uh, the uh, Phillies won game six, the Flyers lost game six, and the uh, Lakers lost game six, all all championship final rounds. And the Eagles were in the Super Bowl and lost to the Raiders. But the fact that all four teams from this town made the championship uh, uh, game that year, I would say that's going to be pretty hard to top. And uh, after I did that, Zach, I figured, okay, uh, I've done all I can in sports. Let's try weather. <laughs> Tom LeMain proving that Philly sports, in Philly sports, it does get better. Thanks again, Tom. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Zach. Thank you. Take care.